When your heroes don't live up to your expectations, part two of the bonus army saga. Good afternoon, this is your tired midnight blogger, what rarely ever blogs at midnight. Going to continue the story of the bonus army, likely going to finish that story in this post. Here we have Walter W. Waters showing determination as he leads the bonus army to Washington, D.C. Could be mistaken, but I think this was him right after it was announced whether or not Congress, or the Senate, I should say, passed the bill. He's skinny, which makes sense. I've been hungry, you wouldn't know it to look at me now, but it's hard to keep meat on the bones when you don't eat regularly. I look at that face, somehow I feel like possibly the wrong people have led our nation these last 90 years. My last post in this series gave you an overview of what the Bonus Army was, how desperate families made a march across the continent for a peaceful showdown. Hmm. Odd, I do seem to recall that we have the right to peacefully assemble. Perhaps I just imagined that. But anyway, they marched across the continent for a peaceful showdown with the government that they felt had done them wrong. I will leave the post below in the comments so you can catch up on it. This post I intend to tell the result of that march and admit to my readers that several of the heroes of my youth have turned out to be bitter disappointments. Follow along if you're brave enough. The standoff. You thought January 6th was something? I don't remember a photo like this. Nor do I remember the crowds being either this peaceful, this resolute, or this disciplined. I wonder what kind of people could stage this kind of a protest when the best we can do in this time is to incite the QAnon shaman. I ended the last post with this quote from Britannica.com. In an effort to force early lump sum payment of these urgently needed benefits, the Bonus Army, sometimes called the Bonus Expeditionary Force, converged on the nation's capital in the spring of 1932. They moved into abandoned shacks below the capital and set up shanties and tents along the Anacostia River. Despite inadequate housing, sanitation, and food, Walter Waters in command, or... Another Sergeant Malcolm Reynolds. OregonEncyclopedia.org has this to say about Waters. It was in Portland that Walter W. Waters, a native Oregonian, first emerged as a forceful and colorful leader of the Bonus Army movement. Born and raised in Burns, Sergeant Waters had served in France and had seen combat at St. Mihail and Chateau Thierry. There were other significant Americans that served there, as we shall learn later. With the onset of the Depression, Waters' small business endeavors failed. He survived as a fruit tramp before coming to Portland. Waters took easily to public speaking, and with veterans calling for the bonus now, he promoted the idea of a veteran's march to present their demand to Congress. Here we have the Bonus Army riding the long blunt train through the line of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. does, in fact, feed off the souls that are lost in pride as the Depression deepened and frustrations mounted. In December of 1931, there was a small communist-led hunger march on Washington. A few weeks later, a Pittsburgh priest led an army of 12,000 jobless men there to agitate for unemployment legislation. In March, 
A riot at Forge River Rouge Plant in Michigan left four dead and over 50 wounded. Thus, when a band of jobless veterans led by a former cannery worker named Walter W. Waters began arriving in the capital in May, tensions were high. Calling themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Forces, they demanded early payment of a bonus Congress had promised them for their service in World War I. As we all know, a few bad apples can spoil the whole barrel. PBS.org continues, Army Chief of Staff MacArthur was convinced that the march was a communist conspiracy to undermine the government of the United States and that the movement was actually far deeper and more dangerous than an effort to secure funds from a nearly depleted federal treasury. But that was simply not the case. Again, this according to PBS.org. MacArthur's own General Staff Intelligence Division reported in June that only three of the 26 leaders of the bonus march were communists. And the percentage within the rank and file was likely even smaller. Several commanders reported to MacArthur that most of the men seemed to be vehemently anti-communist, if anything. According to journalist and eyewitness Joseph C. Harsh, this was not a revolutionary situation. This was a bunch of people in great distress, wanting help. These were simply veterans from World War I who were out of luck, out of money, and wanted to get their bonus, and they needed the money at that moment. End of quote. For a few months, Walters was able to maintain the peace by disciplining and organizing his troops in the same ways they had lived as soldiers during the war. I don't know, but I suspect there was a comfort in this. Like, Maybe the Doughboys had finally come home. Like maybe there was still some fire in the old boys left who had, in our collective American minds at least, paid the debt back to Lafayette. A bill passed in Congress, and even though Hoover promised to veto it, there was still a great deal of hope that America would listen to reason. But on June 17th, the bill was defeated in the Senate. A political cartoon from 1893 won a similar issue of unemployed veterans asking for relief, sharing the belief that the soldier had been shortchanged and the bulk of the money raised for Civil War pensions had been spent in a spurious, wasteful, and fraudulent fashion. How it all ended. HistoryOnTheNet.com shares this quote. Within days of his arrival, Walter Waters had a full-blown lobbying operation underway. On June 4, the BEF marched in full force down the streets of Washington. Veterans filled their representatives' waiting rooms while others gathered outside the Capitol building. On June 14, the bonus bill opposed by Republicans loyal to President Hoover, came to the floor. When Congressman Edward E. Slick, Democrat Tennessee, was speaking in support of the bill, he suddenly fell dead from a heart attack. Thousands of Bonus Army veterans marched in his funeral procession while Congress adjourned out of respect. The following day, June 15, the House of Representatives passed the bonus bill by a vote of 211 to 176. On the 17th, about 8,000 veterans gathered at the Capitol, feeling confident that the Senate would pass the bill. Another 10,000 were stranded behind the Anacostia drawbridge which police had raised to keep them out of the city. Debate continued into the evening. Finally, around 9.30, Senate aides summoned Walters inside. He returned, 
moments later to break the news to the crowd, the bill had been defeated. For a moment it looked as if the veterans would attack the Capitol. Instead, at the suggestion of a reporter, Waters asked the veterans to sing America. When the song was over, they slowly filed back to camp. Many veterans left in defeat. Many thousands remained, having no homes to return to. They were determined to stay until the government decided to either pay the bonuses or to provide jobs or to shoot them. As the Washington summer got hotter, so did tempers. It was only a matter of time before something happened. As the weeks passed, conditions at the camp worsened. Evelyn Walsh McLean, the wealthy owner of the Hope Diamond, contacted Vice President Charles Curtis, guy has a wonderful name, gotta tell you that, who had attended dinner parties at her mansion. Unless something is done for these men, there is bound to be a lot of trouble, she told him. McLean's efforts backfired. Vice President Curtis became paranoid when he saw veterans near his Capitol Hill office on the anniversary of the day the mob stormed to Francis Bastille. President Hoover, Army Chief of Staff MacArthur, and Secretary of War Patrick Patrick J. Hurley increasingly feared that the Bonus Army would turn violent and trigger uprisings in Washington and elsewhere. Hoover was especially troubled by the veterans who occupied abandoned buildings downtown. On July 28, on President Hoover's orders, Police Chief Glassford, who was himself a decorated World War I Brigadier General, arrived with a hundred policemen to evict them. Waters informed Glassford that the men had voted to remain. Just after noon, a small contingent of vets confronted a phalanx of policemen near the armory, resulting in a quick but violent skirmish. Veterans threw bricks while policemen used their nightsticks. Shortly after 1.45 p.m., another fight broke out in a building adjacent to the armory. Shots rang out. When it ended, one veteran lay dead, another mortally wounded. Three policemen were injured. At this point, Army Chief of Staff General MacArthur had had enough. Mr. I Shall Return, decided to put their practice plan into action and assumed personal command. Of course he did. For the first time in the nation's history, tanks rolled through the streets of the capital. MacArthur ordered his men to clear the estimated 8,000 veterans from the downtown area and spectators who had been drawn to the scene by radio reports. A photograph of the Bonus Army clashing with police. Notice that there is no distinction in this army between black and white. Many were uncomfortable with Waters' equal treatment of blacks. In this army, the first such in American history, there was neither white nor black. There was just a fellow soldier who had fought for America. According to PBS.org, President Hoover ordered the Secretary of War to surround the affected area and clear it without delay. Conspicuously led by Arthur, who, by the way, wore the most charming riding pants, Army troops, including Major George S. Patton, Jr. formed infantry cordons and began pushing the veterans out, destroying their makeshift camps as they went. 
Although no weapons were fired, cavalry advanced with swords drawn and some blood was shed. By nightfall, hundreds had been injured by gas, including a baby. That's right, a baby who died. True bravery and glory, George S. Patton. We're able to kill babies. Hundreds had been injured by gas, bricks, clubs, bayonets, and sabers. Next came the most controversial moment in the whole affair, a moment that directly involved General MacArthur. Secretary of War Hurley twice sent orders to MacArthur, indicating that the president worried that the government reaction might look overly harsh. You think? Did not wish the army to pursue the bonus marchers across the bridge into their main encampment on the other side of the Anacostia River. But MacArthur, according to his aide, Dwight Eisenhower, said he was too busy did not want to be bothered by people coming down and pretending to bring orders and sent his men across the bridge anyway. A fire soon erupted in the camp. While it's not clear which side started the blaze, the sight of the great fire became the signature image of the greatest unrest our nation's capital has ever known. I personally, three of my military heroes were involved with attacking fellow World War I soldiers. I don't really even know what to say. The Aftermath. Historyonthenet.com shares this as the ending. Eyewitnesses, including MacArthur's aide Dwight D. Eisenhower, later Supreme Allied Commander of World War II, and two-term president of the United States, insisted that Secretary of War Hurley, speaking for the president, had forbade any troops to cross the bridge into Anacostia, and that at least two high-ranking officers were dispatched by Hurley to convey these orders to MacArthur. Eisenhower later wrote in his book, At Ease, that MacArthur, quote, said he was too busy did not want either himself or his staff bothered by people coming down and pretending to bring orders. Eisenhower put it more bluntly during an interview with the late historian Stephen Ambrose, quote, I told that dumb son of a bitch he had no business going down there, he said, unquote. Going back to historyonthenet.com, around 11 p.m. MacArthur called a press conference to justify his actions, He was so good with his press conferences, wasn't he? Had the president not acted today, had he permitted this thing to go on for 24 hours more, he would have been faced with a grave situation which would have caused a real battle, MacArthur told reporters. Had he let it go on another week, I believe the institutions of our government would have been severely threatened. Over the next few days, newspapers and newsreels shown in movie theaters, yeah, that used to happen, they showed graphic images of violence perpetrated on once uniformed soldiers and their families, those who had won the First World War by uniformed servicemen in movie theaters across America. The army was booed, and MacArthur jeered. The incident only further weakened President Hoover's chances at re-election, then only three months away. Franklin D. Roosevelt won easily. Waters attempted to contain and maintain control of the, the man faded into obscurity, Later, he enlisted in the Navy so that he could fight in World War II. He died in the 50s, unsung.
Patton had been involved in the repression of the Bonus Army. The next day, he was approached by a decorated hero of the Battle Musogon Offensive, in which Patton and Waters had also both seen action. Joseph T. Angelo, who had been decorated for saving Patton's life in that battle, appealed to Patton to have mercy on their fellow veterans. Patton commanded the man be removed forcibly from his presence. The media took hold of this story and it became the symbol for the entire debacle. The uniformed, obedient soldier, Patton, carelessly, coolly, giving no thought that this man was someone he owed his life what was more important, well, if I'm going to be fair, was the orders of his country. I'm sure Patton would say that his debt to his country outweighed his debt to this man. I'm not 100% sure that I agree with that assessment. Britannica.com shares a second bonus army came in May 1933. This time, the army was greeted by the new president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, who, side note, and presidential assistant, Louis Howe. Although, again, no bonus legislation was passed, Congress did create the Civilian Conservation Corps, in which many of the veterans were able to find work. FDR gained political clout by praising the bonus army and taking credit for the Civilian Conservation Corps Act, but in truth he saw them as an annoying rabble. Historyonthenet.com shares this. For each of the next four years, veterans returned to Washington, D.C. to push for a bonus. Many of the men were sent to rehabilitation camps in the Florida Keys. On September 2, 1935, several hundred of them were killed in a hurricane. The government attempted to suppress the news, but the writer, Ernest Hemingway, was aboard one of the first rescue boats, and he wrote an angry piece about it. Resistance to the bonus withered. Finally, in 1936, the year my father was born, the veterans received their bonus. Britannica.com shares that in 1936, Congress finally passed over a presidential veto. Isn't it funny? It didn't matter whether it was Republican or Democrat. The president was always determined that the veterans weren't going to get what they needed. The Congress finally passed over FDR's veto a bill to disperse about $2 billion in veterans' benefits. The Bonus Army laid the foundation for the GI Bill of Rights in 1944. In my next post, I intend to talk about other similar times when America let her troops down, including the aforementioned tensions that soldiers marched about in the 1890s and a much earlier bonus army that has also been forgotten. Stay tuned for more tired blogging. Hemingway, the great American author of the time, he often laid bare the inadequacy of our government. In this case, he actually did a great service to the soldiers. They freed the world. They built our skyscrapers, our dams, including Hoover Dam. And to reward them, we let them starve.